blessing of the energy centers. We've been talking a lot about light and information or energy and consciousness. And now it's time to go a little deeper into those concepts to help explain how the meditation works. As you already understand, everything in our known universe is made up or emits either light and information or energy and consciousness, which are other ways of describing electromagnetic energy. In fact, these elements are so intimately combined that it's impossible to separate them. So I want you to look all around you. Even if you don't see anything other than matter objects, things, people, or places, there's also a sea of infinite invisible frequencies that are carrying encoded information. That means that not only that your body is made up of light and information, of energy and consciousness, but also that you as a conscious being with a body are made of gravitationally organized light packed with information that is continuously sending and receiving various frequencies, all carrying different signals, just like a radio or a cell phone. So all frequency, of course, carries information. Think about radio waves just for a moment. There are radio waves moving through the room that you're sitting in right now. So if you turned a radio on, you could tune, tune it into a specific wavelength or signal. And then a little transducer in the radio would pick up that signal and turn it into sound that you could hear and understand as your favorite song or the news or even a commercial. But just because you can't see the radio waves in the air doesn't mean that they're not there. They're carrying distinct information on a specific frequency all the time. And if you change the frequency a small degree and tune into another station, a different message will be carried on that wavelength. So take a look in your book at figure 4.1a, which shows the entire light spectrum and demonstrates all the electromagnetic frequencies that we know of visible light spectrum where we perceive the various array of colors present in this world we live in. Again, the visible light spectrum where we perceive the various array of colors present in this world we live in makes up less than 1% of all the frequencies of light that exist. And that means that the majority of the frequencies are beyond our perception and therefore most of our known reality in this universe cannot be experienced by our senses. So aside from our ability to perceive light, being absorbed, absorbed or reflected off objects and things, the truth is that we are able to perceive only a very small spectrum of reality. And there's a lot of other information available to us besides what we can see with our physical eyes. So remember that when I refer to light, I'm talking about all light, which includes the entire spectrum of electromagnetic frequencies, both the seen and unseen, and not just visible light. So the, this next figure, if you look on your book, you'll see that this figure represents the entire spectrum of electromagnetic frequencies from the zero point field showing down in frequency all the way to matter. So as the energy increases, or as the frequency speeds up, the wavelengths decrease. And as energy decreases, or as the frequency slows down, wavelengths increase. So instead of a shorter wavelength, you have a longer wavelength. So in the middle, labeled visible light, is the only spectrum of reality we perceive. So for example, even though we don't see x-rays, they still exist. We know this because as human beings, we have the ability to create x-rays. We can also measure them. In fact, an infinite number of frequencies exist within the spectrum of x-ray light. X-rays are a faster frequency than the visible light. And therefore, they have more energy because again, the faster the frequency is, the higher its energy. So matter by itself is the densest of frequencies because it's the slowest. 
and the most condensed form of light and information. Here in figure 4.1b, here we see the relationship between frequency and wavelength and the number of cycles in a complete wave represented between letters A, B, B and C, and so on in a wavelength. So the space between the two vertical arrows pointing down represent a time interval of just one second. And in this case, since there are five complete waves with the span of one second, we would say that the frequency is five, five cycles per second or five hertz. So if you take a look at figure 4.1b, yeah, so take a look at figure 4.1b and move your eyes along the horizontal line running through the waves, hills, and valleys, starting at the letter A and then moving to B and then to C. Each time you arrive at the next letter, you have just traveled a full cycle, which is referred to as a wavelength. So the distance between letters A and B is one wavelength, and the frequency of a wave refers to the number of wavelengths of cycles produced in one second, which is measured in hertz. So therefore, the faster the frequency of a wave, the shorter the wavelength. The converse is also true. The slower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. That's figure 4.1c. So for example, light in the infrared frequency band has a slower frequency than light in the ultraviolet light frequency band. So the wavelengths for infrared light are longer and the wavelengths for ultraviolet light are actually shorter. So here's another example. This time from within the visible light spectrum, the color red has a slower frequency, 450 cycles per second than the color blue, which is 650 cycles per second. I'm gonna repeat, repeat that one more time. The color red, has a slower frequency of 450 cycles per second than the color blue, which is 650 cycles per second. Therefore, the wavelength of red is longer than the wavelength of blue. So now the relationship between frequency and wavelength. As frequency increases, wavelengths get shorter. As frequency decreases, the wavelengths get longer. So throughout history, People have made several different attempts to photograph and to measure fields of light. One prominent example is Curlian photography, discovered in 1939 by Russian electrician and amateur inventor, Semyon Davidovich Curlian. With this technique, Curlian was able to capture images of electromagnetic, I'm sorry, of electromagnetic field that surrounds both living and non-living objects. So he found that by putting a sheet of photographic film on a metal plate, placing an object on top of the film and applying a high voltage current to the metal plate, an image of the electrical discharge between the object and the plate would show up on the film, appearing like a glowing silhouette of light around whatever was being photographed. And one of Curlian's many experiments, he reportedly photographed two seemingly identical leaves from one healthy plant and from one diseased plant. The photograph of the leaf from the healthy plant showed a strong light field, while the other showed a much weaker glow, leading to Curlian to believe that his photographic technique might be a means of assessing health. So while scientists debate the usefulness of Curlian photography, as a diagnostic tool, research on the technique continues. So a more recent development along these lines comes from a German biophysicist, Fritz Albert Popp, PhD, who has spent more than three decades studying biophotons, tiny low intensity light particles that are stored within and emitted by all living things. In 1996, Popp founded the International Institute of Biophysics. It's a network of research laboratories from more than a dozen countries around the world that study biophotons. Pop and his fellow IBB, IIB, I'm sorry, Pop and his fellow IIB researchers believe that the information contained in these light particles, which are stored in DNA, communicates extremely effectively with the cells of the organism 
thus playing a vital role in regulating the organism's function. These biophotons can be detected by an extremely sensitive camera designed to measure their emissions. The stronger the emissions, as well as the more intense and coherent the light field, the greater the communication between the cells and the healthier organism. So in order to sustain life and health, our cells communicate with each other by exchanging vital information transmitted on different frequencies of light. So Pop discovered that the reverse is also true. When a cell does not emit enough organized and coherent electromagnetic energy, that cell becomes unhealthy. It's simply not able to share information with other cells well. And without that exchange, it doesn't have what it needs. So the mechanistic version of the inner workings of that cell that we learned in high school biology is dated. Charged molecules attracting and repelling each other are not responsible for the ways that cells actually work. Instead, the electromagnetic energy that the cell emits and receives is the life force that governs those molecules. So that's a vitalistic view that supports the truth of who we actually are. So what all this means is, in effect, is that we are quite literally beings of light, each radiating a very vital light force and expressing an actual field around our bodies. The totality of, the totality of each cell expressing and contributing to a vital field of light that carries a message. It would be safe to say then that the more we define reality with our senses and live our lives as materialists, focusing primarily on the physical and therefore the more we turn on the stress response, the more we may be missing out on valuable information. That's because the more we keep narrowing our focus on the matter, objects, things, people, and places in our outer world, the less we are able to sense those other frequencies that aren't visible with the naked eye. And if we are unaware of them, they do not exist to us. As you have already read, and I hope begun to experience yourself with the meditation in the previous chapter, it's possible for you to tune into certain frequencies around you, just like you can tune a radio dial to 107.3. So when you close your eyes and sit still and eliminate the external environment, the static that normally keeps you from sensing those other frequencies, you can train yourself to get a clear signal and receive information from it. And when you do this repeatedly, you tune in to a new level of light and information that you can use to influence or affect matter. When you do that, your body experiences syntropy. It's an enhanced order instead of entropy disorder, physical breakdown, and chaos. So once you can quiet down your analytical thinking mind more readily, tune into this more orderly information, your body automatically responds by processing this new stream of consciousness and energy, thereby becoming more efficient, coherent, and healthy. So as you, as you have already read, and I hope begun to experience yourself with the, with the meditation in the previous chapter, it's possible for you to tune into certain frequencies around you, just like you can tune a radio dial to 107.3. So when you close your eyes and sit still and eliminate the external environment, the static that normally keeps you from sensing those other frequencies, you can train yourself to get a clear signal and receive information from it. When you do this repeatedly, you tune in to a new level of light and information that you can use to influence 
or affect matter. So when you do that, your body experiences syntropy, which is enhanced order, instead of entropy, which is disorder, chaos, breakdown. So once you can quiet down your analytical thinking mind and more readily tune into this more orderly information, your body automatically responds by processing this new stream of consciousness and energy, thereby becoming more efficient, coherent, and healthy. Convergent and divergent focus. So at the beginning of the meditation in the last chapter, I asked you to rest your attention in different parts of your body as well as in space around different parts of it. So now I want to dive deeper into why I ask you to do that in almost all of my meditations. So when you practice this, you sharpen your ability to master different ways your brain can focus using convergent focus and divergent focus. So remember our previous discussion about living in survival mode with the hormones of stress continually pumping through our bodies, helping us stay at that ready to flight or flee mode. When we're in that state, we narrow our focus even further because paying very close attention to the external physical world becomes very important. In effect, we become materialists, defining reality with any one of our five senses. So the different compartments of the brain that normally work in community then begin to subdivide, no longer communicating effectively with each other and no longer working together seamlessly in a state of coherence, orderliness. Now they're in, in an incoherent state, sending incoherent messages down the spinal cord to various parts of the body. And we've seen this over and over and over again when we do brain scans to measure brain waves. I'm gonna pause right here because one of the things that I absolutely love about Dr. Joe is that not only has he dovetailed science and spirituality, that hidden knowledge that the mystics that you hear about in the Law of One by Hermes Trismegustus, the Emerald Tablets, the Kabbalah, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so forth, but he actually has the scientific proof, like I said before, from the white papers and researches and so forth, but he actually measures in the community of the mystics that attend his monastery, he actually measures. And there are now four medical schools that actually have that data, and it's defying anything that medicine has ever seen before, because the normal standard deviation, for example, for your brain waves is normally two, three, up to the higher end is four points above the average. However, with the electroencephalograms where they have people wired up in the monastery, we have witnessed and he has measured to the awe of most of the neurosurgeons and the physicists, et cetera, the Heart Math Institute and whatnot, we'll see 200, 300, up to 400 points above the norm during our seven day advanced monastery educational retreats. So this is unprecedented. Uh, it's incredible. It works if you work it. And not all of these people knew how to meditate before they came. Many of them, they're just getting started. Others have meditated for quite a long time. It covers you know, soup to nuts from the most elementary to the most sophisticated, and the results are indisputable. So back to the book. As I've said before, when your brain is incoherent, you are incoherent. So I want you to think about that for a moment. If your physiological brain is incoherent, that means that you as a human being, head to toe, and the way you communicate and the way you are thinking and perceiving is disorderly. It's incoherent. That's not acceptable, but it can be fixed and you can fix it. You don't need to go find anybody to fix you. You can make those adjustments yourself.
So, and when your brain is not working right, you are not working right. It's as though instead of playing a beautiful symphony, your brain and body are producing a cacophony. And because of this unbalanced, incoherent state, you are left trying to control or force outcomes in your life. You try to predict a future that's based on the past. And you do that in part by paying more attention to your outer world of objects and the things that instead of your inner world of thoughts and feelings. So in other words, you stay in narrow, convergent, obsessively thinking about the same things over and over and over again. That's what stress does. It influences you to obsess about your problems so you can be prepared for the future worst case scenario based on your past memories. Being prepared for the worst outcome possible gives you a better chance of survival because no matter what happens, you're prepared. You're allegedly prepared. You think you're prepared for it. However, when you change your attention from using this narrow focus to adopting a more open and broad focus, as you will do in this meditation, you can become aware of the space and so the light and energy around your body in space. This is now called a divergent focus. I'm going to read that one more time again because this is a concept that is not widely discussed and talked about in the outside regular general populace. So I want you to pay close attention to this again. However, when you change your focus and your attention from using a narrow focus of attention to adopting a more open and broad focus, as you will do in this meditation, you can become aware of space. And so the light and the energy all around your body in space, this is called a divergent focus. You go from focusing on some thing to fo focusing on no thing on the wave energy instead of the particle, matter. Reality is both particle and wave. It's both matter and energy. So when you practice using your narrow focus to rest your attention in different parts of the body, acknowledging the particle, and then you open your focus so that you sense the space around these parts, of your body in space, acknowledging the wave, your brain changes into a more coherent state and a balanced state. So, entering the subconscious mind. In the 1970s, Les Femi, PhD, director of Princeton Biofeedback Center in Princeton, New Jersey, discovered how this shift in attention from narrow to open focus changes brain waves. Femi, a pioneer in the attention and biofeedback, was trying to find a method of teaching people how to move their brain waves from beta, which is conscious thought, to alpha, relaxed and creative. The most effective way to make the shift he discovered was by directing people to become aware of space or nothingness. Imagine that, that you can accomplish so much with so little. If that's not a paradox, I don't know what is. Fascinating. So it was by directing people to become aware of space or nothingness, adopting what he called open focus. So the Buddhist tradition has been using this method of meditation for thousands of years. And as you open your focus and sense information instead of matter, your brain waves actually slow down from beta to alpha. And this makes sense because when you are sensing and feeling, you're not thinking. So as your thinking brain, the neocortex, which is like the helmet, the top part of your brain, when it slows, slows down, 
you're able to get beyond the analytical left brain, also called the critical mind, which separates the conscious mind, you know, your conscious mind from your subconscious mind. So now you're able to move into the seat of your body's operating system, the autonomic nervous system, which you read about in the previous chapter. And now your brain can work in a more holistic fashion. So one of the main purposes of meditation move beyond the analytical mind. What separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. As you slow your brain waves down, you move out of your conscious mind and thinking brain past the analytical mind and into the operating system of the subconscious mind where all the automatic programs and unconscious habits exist. So as you do the blessing of the energy centers meditation, I will teach you later in this chapter, you'll place your attention in each of your body centers, energy centers, also referred to as chakras, meaning wheels in ancient East Indian Vedic texts. And then you'll open your focus because where you place your attention is where you place your energy. And as you place your attention in each center and the energy moves to it, each one of these individual centers become activated. So it's no mystery that if you have a sexual fantasy in your mind and brain, for example, as energy moves into the centers of your body, it's going to become activated in a very specific way. And when it does, the organs, the tissues, the chemicals, the hormones, and nervous tissue are all going to respond. So if you're hungry and you're thinking about what you're going to eat, it's no coincidence that your digestive juices turn on. You salivate and your body prepares for the experience of eating dinner because energy is activated in that area. But if you're thinking about telling your boss off or arguing with your daughter, you secrete adrenaline ahead of the actual confrontation. So in each of these cases, the thought you're thinking becomes the actual experience. And I will explain this in more detail in the next section when we talk about the individual energy centers. But for now, it's enough to know that this happens because each center produces its own chemical hormonal expression, which in turn activates the organs, the tissues, and the cells in each area. So imagine what would begin to happen if you were able to slow your brain waves down in a meditation and get into the operating system of each of those energy centers by placing your attention in the space around each energy center. Opening your focus, each of these centers would then become more orderly and more coherent, which would then signal neurons to create a new level of mind and activate the organs and tissues and cells of that region, producing each center's own hormones and chemical messengers. And if you did this repeatedly, over time you would begin to affect real physical change. So in the community of students who do this work, people have healed themselves of chronic bladder infections, prostate problems, impotence, diverculitis, Crohn disease, food allergies, and other sensitivities like celiac disease, ovarian tumors, elevated liver enzymes, acid reflux, heart palpitations, arrhythmia, asthma, lung conditions, back problems, thyroid conditions, throat cancer, neck pain, chronic migraine, headaches, brain tumors, and more. We've seen all kinds of improvements in people from doing this particular type of meditation sometimes even after the very first time they do it. Those dramatic healings were possible because students were able to epigenetically change the expression of their DNA, switching some of the genes on and others off, changing how those genes express proteins in their actual physical bodies. And so as you learned in chapter two, so now how your body's energy centers work. We're about to take a closer look at each of the body's energy centers, but first I wanna explain a bit more about how they work 
Think of them as an individual center of information. Each has its own specific energy that carries a corresponding level of consciousness, its own emission of light expressing very specific information or its own frequency carrying a certain message. And each also has its own individual glands, its own unique hormones, its own chemistry and its own individual plexus of neurons. Think of these individual clusters or neuro of neurological networks as like mini brains. And each one of these centers has its own individual brain. Then each has also its own individual mind. I'm gonna read this again because this is something that is little known. We've Everybody knows that we have a brain, everybody knows um, you know, in some cultures we talk about, you know, the heart being the brain or the gut being the brain. Those are the three most common brains that we're aware of. But actually, each one of our eight energy centers, seven inside the body and one above, each one of those has its own brain, its own consciousness, and its own plexus neural network. Imagine what you can do with that. So take a look in your books at figure 4.3, which lists the location of each center as well as the anatomy and physiology that are associated with, with each. So I'm not gonna show you the diagram during this broadcast. I'm gonna encourage you by now, I would hope that most of you have your book so that you can turn to the um, figure in your book, we're on page 113 of the book, and you can see there the diagram that shows all of the energy centers. And it's starting with the first energy center, which is at the base of your perineum, where your sec which it affects your sexual glands. It's your inferior mesenteric plexus. The second one is just two inches below your belly button. Digestive and pancreatic glands are affected by this energy center that's in your superior mesenteric plexus. The third one being in your gut, also known as your solar plexus, it affects your adrenal glands. The fourth is your heart plexus. In your heart, it affects your thymus gland. I'm gonna stop there for a moment because uh, all of us have seen Tarzan and you, know, you see apes that go like this. The reason why they do that is because they are activating the thymus gland that gives them more energy. It's something that if you understand a little bit about biochemistry and a little bit about physiology, you'll understand that anybody can do this. You can do this every day, just do tapping to that acupressure point and that will activate your thymus gland and you will get the benefit from activating your thymus gland. Okay, it's a little freebie there for you. Okay, so the next one is your fifth energy center, which is your thyroid plexus, which affects your thyroid gland. You're speaking, of course. The next one is behind the bridge of your nose called the pineal plexus, which affects your pineal gland. Your pineal gland, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of misinformation out there about exactly where the pineal gland is, but it is the easiest way to describe it in my opinion is it's directly behind the bridge of your nose, but it's actually in the center of your brain. So Dr. Joe likes to say, if you take your, your, fingers here at the nape of your neck where your hairline ends and you take your finger inside your mouth and you point it upwards in your throat where those two lines intersect, which is basically going to be in the center of your brain behind here. That's where your pineal gland is. And your pineal gland is just the size of a tiny little rice grain. It is very, very tiny, very, very powerful, but very tiny. Okay. So those are the energy centers of the body. So each energy center of your body has its own biological makeup and they have their own glands and hormones, chemicals and individual mini brains, a plexus of neurons as we discussed before and therefore their own mind. Um, I'm going to, I did find um, a graphic that shows not only the physiological uh, makeup of the inside of the brain showing you exactly where the pineal gland is and where the pituitary gland is in relation to the pineal gland because they're not even, an in, not even an inch and a half. I think they're like three centimeters or four from each other um, inside the middle, the midbrain. 
which is your neocortex um, inside the middle brain. But in this diagram that I have, it actually shows you the exterior of you too, so that you see in relation to how the brain is positioned, you actually see the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and so forth, so that you can get a better representation to where it really is. Because a lot of the diagrams out there just have the brain on the inside. None of us look at our brain on the inside, but to understand what our brain looks like on the inside in relation to where our eyes, nose, mouth, ears sit, I think is very helpful. As you learned in the second chapter, when consciousness activates neurological... No. <laughs> Okay, so as you learned in the second chapter, when consciousness activates neurological tissue, it creates mind. Mind is the brain in action, so each one of these energy centers has a plexus of neurons, then each has its own individual mind, or better said, each center has a mind of its own, and what activates the mind is energy with directive and intention, a conscious intent. So when each of these centers becomes activated, it in turn activates hormones, tissues, chemicals, and cellular functions, and it emits energy. I'm gonna stop here for a second because um, sometimes I have people who, as I guide certain individuals, they sometimes tell me, it's like, well, exactly how do I go about setting intention? Exactly what does that even mean? You know, I know when I set attention to something, what that's like, but intention, exactly what is that? And the clue is actually in the word. So much of our, there's so much, there's so many signs and so many hidden in plain sight information that we're not even really aware of because we kind of gloss over things and we don't think about it twice. But if you look at the word intention, you have the word attention. So to pay attention, for example, right now you're paying attention to this broadcast and you're listening with attention to what is being said and you're watching, paying attention with your eyes to what you're seeing on the screen. Intention is to take attention inside. That's why it's intention, not attention. Attention is outside focus on something. Intention is inward focus to something within you. That's why it's intention. So I hope that helps you distinguish one from the other so that you can set your intention properly as you intend to sit down and meditate and manifest a healing or whatever reason it is that you are going to be, you know, whatever the purpose is for your meditation. For example, when your first center, the seat of your reproductive glands, is activated with energy, its mind has a very specific agenda and intention. When you as a conscious being have a thought or a fantasy, that's consciousness. By the way, acting on neurological tissue, the next thing you know, your body is physiologically changing and therefore so is your energy. Your body secretes chemicals and hormones from those corresponding glands to emotionally prepare you for intercourse. And you have more energy in that center now. And it's releasing its own specific frequency, carrying an intentional message. So that energy carrying the conscious intention is activating that reproductive center. And the mind and the brain is influencing the mind and the body at the level of its individual nerve plexus. So this mind is located in that specific area of the body through this mini brain. And it operates on a subconscious level through the autonomic nervous system. It's beyond your conscious control. And we could say that the body is now following the mind as the mini brain in that energy center activates the related glands, which in turn activate corresponding hormones that signal the appropriate chemicals to change the body's emotional state and physiology. And when you are emitting a very clear energy, carrying a specific directive out of that center. We have all felt that kind of energy from a very sexual person. 
once the energy is moving through the neurological tissues or plexus of neurons, it creates mind at that level. So when it's activated, that center has a mind of its own. The second center also has its own mind. And when we activate its mini brain and thus its mind, we trust our gut. And the same sequence of events happens in the center as we just saw in the first energy center, but with different corresponding neurocircuitry, hormones, chemicals, emotions, energy, and information. In fact, this area has been called the second brain because of the hundreds of millions of neurons and neural connections here, more than exist in either the spinal cord or the peripheral nervous system. In fact, 95% of the feel-good hormone, serotonin, in your body is found not in your brain, but in your bowels. So trusting our gut literally means trusting our instincts. It's almost as if our body and this center's brain can override our analytical rational thinking brain and mind. So how about your heart center? What happens when you read with your heart? Like the first two centers, this fourth center located in the middle of the chest has its own frequency, its own hormones, its own chemicals, its own emotions, and its own mini brain that draws from a field of energy and information that surrounds it. And when you read with your heart, you tend to be more caring, kind, inspired, selfless, compassionate, giving, grateful, trusting, and patient. When this mini brain gets that information, it sends instructions and messages to the organs and tissues that are located in that part of your body. And you emit loving energy from the specific center of information. Now let's look at each of these energy centers in more detail. Some of the centers will overlap a little bit in function, but for the most part, if you know even just a little bit about the body, they're pretty self-explanatory. So you, you can review figure 4.3 again if you need to. So getting better acquainted with the energy centers. The first energy center governs the region of your sex organs, including your perineum your pelvic floor, the glands that are connected to your vagina and penis, your prostate, if you're a man, your bladder and your bowel and your anus. This energy center has to do with reproduction and procreation, elimination, sexuality, and sexual identity. The hormones, estrogen and progesterone in women and testosterone in men are correlated with this center. Energy center is also located and associated with the inferior mesenteric nervous plexus. So a tremendous amount of energy, creative energy, exists in this first center. So think about the amount of energy you use to make life and create a baby. When this center is in balance, your creative energy flows easily, and you are also grounded in your sexual identity. The second energy center is behind and slightly below your navel. It governs the ovaries, uterus, colon, pancreas, and lower back. It has to do with consumption, digestion, elimination, and the breaking down of food into energy, including digestive enzymes and juices, as well as the enzymes and hormones that balance your blood sugar levels. This center is also connected to the superior mesenteric nerve plexus. So this energy center is also related to social networks and structures, relationships, support systems, family cultures, and interpersonal relationships. Think about it as the center for holding on or letting go, consuming or eliminating. When this center is in balance, you feel safe and secure both in your environment and in the world. That's very interesting. I'm gonna pause here for a second because what this tells me is that people who are very fearful, fearful of their exterior environment, of whatever governments, politics, whatever um, you know, 
uh, potential crisis, um, natural disaster. They're always you know worried about the next natural disaster, um, the next emergency. Obviously, there's something off with this second energy center, which is what has has them out of balance and they're not able to have the energy continuously flowing so that it can move up to your third energy center, your fourth energy center. Once you get up to the fourth energy center, then it's kind of like a home run because you can't help but have the energy from your heart energy center then just explodes up and it goes to your fifth and your sixth, seventh and eighth energy center. So especially during this time that we we find ourselves in right now in 2020 during everything that's going on globally. Uh, I would imagine that a lot of people are having issues, not only with their first, but also their second and third energy center. So something to think about. Okay, the third energy center is located in the pit of your gut. It governs the stomach, the small intestine, spleen, liver, gallbladder, adrenal glands, and kidneys. And the associated hormones include adrenaline, and cortisol, the kidney hormones and chemicals like renin, angiotensin, erythropoietin, and all the liver enzymes, as well as the stomach enzymes like pepsin, tripsin, uh, chymotrypsin, and hydrochloric acid. This energy center is also related to the solar plexus, which is also called the celiac plexus. So this center is associated with our will our power, our self-importance, our control, our drive, aggression, and dominance. It is the center of competitive action and of personal power, self-esteem and directed intention. When the third center is in balance, you use your will and your drive to overcome your environment and conditions in your life. Unlike the second center, this center becomes naturally activated when you perceive that your environment is not safe or is unpredictable. So you must protect and take care of your tribe and yourself. The third center is also active when you want something you need to use your body. You, yeah, I'm sorry about that. The third center is also active when you want something and you need to use your body to get it. So the fourth energy center is located in the space behind your breastbone. It governs your heart, lungs, thymus gland, and the body's main immunity gland, also known as the fountain of youth. The hormones associated with this center include growth hormone and oxytocin, as well as a cascade of 1,400 different chemicals that stimulate the immune system's health via the thymus gland, which is responsible for growth and repair and regeneration of the body. The nerve plexus, this center governs is the heart plexus. I'm going to pause right here. For, so for any of us who want to um, want growth and repair, we want to be rejuvenated, we want to feel as um, young as possible, it's all right here in the thymus gland, in the fourth energy center. That's where we need to not only use our intention and our convergent focus to focus on that energy center so that it opens up our heart and we broadcast that heart centered electromagnetic field and that heart brain but also so, so that you tune in tap in and turn on to the thymus gland which is again that is the fountain of youth and it also is your immunity gland so it's going to ward off any foreign invader that um, is not supposed to it's not supposed to be around us. So it's gonna keep us healthy because it's going to boost our immune system. So the first three centers are all about survival and reflect our animal nature or our humanity. So, but in this fourth energy center, we are moving from being selfish to selfless. So this center is associated with the emotions of love and caring, nurturing, compassion, gratitude, thankfulness, appreciation, kindness, inspiration, selflessness, wholeness, and trust. And it is where our divinity originates. It is the seat of our soul. So when this fourth energy center is in balance, 
We care about others and we want to work in cooperation for the greatest good of the community. We feel a genuine love for life. We feel whole and we're satisfied with who we are. This fifth energy center is located in the center of your throat. It governs the thyroid, parathyroid, the salivary glands, and tissues of the neck. So the hormones associated with this center include the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, thyroxine, and parathyroid chemicals that govern the body's metabolism and circulating calcium levels. The nerve plexus this center governs is the thyroid plexus. So this center is associated with expressing the love you felt in the fourth energy center, as well as speaking your truth and personally empowering your reality through language and sound. When the fifth center is balanced, your voice, you, you voice your present truth, which includes expressing your love. You feel so pleased with yourself and with life that you just have to share your thoughts and feelings. So the sixth energy center is located in the space between the back of your throat and the back of your head. If that's too complicated to picture, <clears throat> just think of it as the center of your brain, slightly towards the back of your head, and it governs the pineal gland, which is a sacred gland. Some people call the pineal the third eye, but I call it the first eye. It's associated with the door to higher dimensions and shifting your perception so you can actually see beyond the veil or see reality in a non-linear way. So when this center is open, it's like a radio antenna that you can use to tune into higher frequencies beyond the five senses. This is where the alchemist in you awakens. And I devote a whole chapter to the pineal gland later in the book. But for now, know that the pineal gland secretes hormones like serotonin and melatonin, as well as some of the other wonderful metabolites which are responsible for your circadian rhythms of feeling awake in response to visible light during the day and sleeping in response to being in darkness at night. In fact, the pineal gland is sensitive to all electromagnetic frequencies besides visible light and can produce corresponding chemical derivatives of a melatonin that change your view of reality. When this gland is in balance, your brain works in a clear manner. You are lucid, more conscious of both your inner world and outer world, seeing and perceiving more and more each day. So the seventh energy center is located in the center of your head, and it, it includes your pituitary gland. This gland has been called the master gland because it governs and creates harmony in a downward cascade from the center of your brain to your pineal gland, to your thyroid gland, to your thymus gland, your adrenal glands, your pancreatic gland, all the way down to your sexual organs. And this is the center of the body where you experience the greatest expression of divinity. This is where your divinity, your highest level of consciousness originates. When this gland is in balance, you are in harmony with all things. The eighth energy center is located about 16 inches above your head. So it's the only energy center that is not associated with an area of the physical body. The Egyptians called it the Ka, K-A, Ka. It represents your connection to the cosmos, to the universe, to the whole. When this center becomes activated, you feel worthy to receive, and that opens you up to insights, epiphanies, deep understandings, and creative downloads of frequency and information that come into your physical body and brain 
not from memories stored inside your nervous system, but from the cosmos, the universe, the unified field, or whatever you want to call that power that is greater than our individual selves. We access that data and memory of the quantum field through this center. Evolving our energy. Now that I have described each of these energy centers in detail, let's take a more dynamic look at how they can work. Certainly, our bodies are designed to use energy in each of the centers as I have outlined. But what happens when we do more with our energy than just survive? What happens when instead of releasing all our energy outward to procreate, to digest food, to run from danger, and so on, we begin to consciously and consistently evolve some of that energy upward from one center to the next, increasing its frequency as it ascends. Here's what that would look like. We start out by channeling our creative energy from the first center. When we feel safe and secure to create, that creative energy evolves, ascending and flowing to the second energy center. When we have to master some limitation or overcome some condition in our environment, we are able to put that creative energy to good use. And then it will flow to the third center, the seat of our will and our power. When we successfully transcend the adversity in our life, which has challenged us to grow and overcome, we have the opportunity to feel more whole, more free, and more satisfied. And we're able to feel genuine love for self and for others as the energy flows through and activates the fourth center. When that happens, we then want to express our present truth. What we've learned or the love or wholeness we feel. And that allows the energy to then move through and turn on our fifth center. After this, when the evolution of energy activates the sixth center, dormant areas of the brain open up. So the veil of illusion is lifted and we perceive a broader spectrum of reality than we ever saw before. We then begin to feel enlightened. The body moves more into harmony and balance and our external environment, including the natural world surrounding us, also moves into more harmony and balance as the energy ascends into activating the seventh energy center. And once we feel that enlightened energy, we begin to truly feel worthy and the energy can finally rise to activate the eighth energy center where we receive the fruits of our efforts, visions, dreams, insights, manifestations, and knowingness that come not from anywhere, within our minds and bodies as memories, but from a greater power in and around us. So this continuous flow of evolving energy from our first center all the way through the eighth center is illustrated in figure 4.4a. So if you have a book and you're following along, we are right now on figure 4.4a. And that is on page 120 of the book. Okay, so as we evolve our creative energy, it can be channeled from the first center all the way to the top, all the way up to the brain and beyond. Each energy center has its own individual frequency that carries its own individual intent. So that's the kind of personal evolution that happens when the energy flows consistently, the ideal. What all too often happens, however, is that the events of our lives and the way we react to them cause our energy to get stuck so that it doesn't flow in this magnificent pattern I just outlined. The places in your body where the energy gets stuck are the energy centers associated with the issues you're dealing with. So figure 4.4b depicts what happens when the energy gets stuck and it can't flow into the higher energy centers. So you're basically cut off at whatever, whether it's your second or your third energy center, it's just stuck in those first three. 
it's no wonder that you have, if it's not addressed, it just gets worse and worse. So in the diagram, he does talk about how energy gets stuck. And for the first energy center, some of the symptoms are, I'm just going to read them straight off the list. Sexual depravity, sexual addiction, sexual anxiety, sexual confusion and pain, trauma from molestation. That's first energy center. The second energy center, you have guilt, shame, pain, unworthiness, lack, and victimization. Third energy center is competition, control, impatience, ego, and self-aggrandizement. Okay? So when energy becomes stuck in our body, it cannot flow to the higher centers. Since emotions are energy, these emotions get stuck in different centers and we can't evolve. So if, for example, a person has been sexually abused or has been conditioned since childhood to think that sex is bad, their energy can stay stuck in the first center, the center associated with sexuality, and they may have problems accessing creativity. If on the other hand, a person can access their creativity, but doesn't necessarily feel safe enough to use their creativity in the world, instead feeling victimized by their social and interpersonal relationships, or if they have been traumatized or betrayed by another person, they might hold on to that energy in their second center. Such a person would be likely to feel excessive amounts of guilt, shame, suffering, low self-esteem, or fear. Now, if a person can get their energy flowing up to their third energy center, but they have ego issues and they feel self-important, self-absorbed, controlling, domineering, angry, overly competitive, and bitter, then their energy gets stuck in their third center and they may have control issues or motivation issues. And if a person cannot open their heart and feel love and trust, or if they are afraid to express love or how they truthfully feel, energy can also become frozen in the fourth and the fifth centers, respectively. So while energy can get stuck in any of the energy centers, these first three centers are where it tends to get stuck the most often. And when it's stuck, it can't evolve and flow in the seamless current described earlier, which switches on the higher energy centers where we're in love with life and want to give back. So getting that circuitry flowing the way it was designed to do is the whole point of doing the blessing of the energy centers meditation. So we bless each of these centers so we can get stuck energy flowing again. Drawing from our energy field. As we discussed earlier, our bodies are surrounded by invisible fields of electromagnetic energy that are always carrying a conscious intention or directive. So when we activate each body's seven energy centers, we could say that we are expressing energy out of these centers. Simply put, when we are conscious beings activate a specific energy in each individual center, we stimulate the associated neurological plexus to produce a level of mind that then activates the proper glands, tissues, hormones, and chemicals in each center. So once each unique center is turned on, the body emits energy carrying specific information or intention from it. So however, if we keep living in survival, and we are overly sexual, over-consuming, or overstressed by living our lives from the first three energy centers, we keep drawing from this invisible field of energy carrying information that surrounds the body. And we are consistently turning it into chemistry. The repetition of this process over time causes the field around the body to shrink. So see figure 4.5 in your books. So as we as we move forward and as a result of this, we diminish our light and there's no energy that carries a conscious intention through these centers to create the correlated mind in each. Essentially, we've tapped 
our own energy field as a resource. The limited level of mind with its limited amount of energy in each center will send a limited signal to the surrounding cells, tissues, organs, and systems of the body. And the result can produce a weakened signal and a lower frequency of energy carrying vital information to the body. Therefore, the lowering frequency of the signals creates disease. We could say that from an energetic level, all disease is a lowering of frequency and an incoherent message. Living in survival. So the first three energy centers are energy consumers. Think about that. The first, the second, and the third energy center are energy consumers. When we overutilize these first three centers, we constantly draw from the invisible field of energy and turn it into chemistry. The field around our body begins to shrink. Remember how I said that the lower three energy centers of the body are concerned with survival? So they represent our selfish nature. They're about using power, aggression, force, or competition so we can survive the conditions in our environment long enough to consume food, to nourish ourselves, and then procreate and keep the species going, as opposed to the upper five centers, which represent our selfless nature and are concerned with more altruistic thoughts and emotions. So nature has made these three lower energy centers very pleasurable so that we keep engaging the actions related to them and what they represent. Having sex, first center, and eating, second center, are quite enjoyable, as is connecting and communicating with others. Also the second center. Personal power, the third center, can be intoxicating, including the success of overcoming obstacles, getting what we want, competing against others and winning, surviving in a particular environment, and pushing ourselves to move our bodies around, period. I'm going to pause here for a second because I know that many of us are well aware of people who always, who are always communicating and always talking about surviving. I've always survived and I'm just trying to survive. I'm just trying to get past this period in my life or this, um, this month, this week, this, this COVID threat. They don't even have the COVID virus or, or any risk of it, but they're trying to get past or, you know, survive that threat. It's all, everything is communicated from a perspective of survival. So if you or someone you know is always communicating from that level and that's the languaging that you hear. Everything is surviving. I just, you know, I need a, I need a job to survive. I need, you fill in the blank, to survive. Then that's an indicator that you may have your first or second or third or all three energy centers blocked, which is needing you to direct your attention and intention in your meditation to just, to just do the blessing of the energy centers. Bless all of your energy centers and that will start to, Move, shaking it up and it'll start to move the energy so that you now signal your brain to signal your autonomic nervous system to get the energy moving and flowing again. That's all that's needed. It's not overly complicated. Thank goodness. Okay. So moving on. So you can see then why some people may tend to overutilize one or more of their first three centers and in doing so consume more of the field of vital energy and information surrounding the body. For example, an overly sexual person draws extra energy from the field of energy surrounding their first center. A person trapped in shame or guilt who feels victimized holds on to the emotions of the past and constantly suffers, is consuming excess energy from the energy field surrounding their second energy center, and so holds on to the energy in that center. So an overly controlling or stressed person pulls additional energy from the field surrounding their third energy center. So when our consciousness is not evolving, neither is our energy. Just reading, reading that feels a little exhausting to me. Uh, can you imagine somebody who's trying to control everything and everyone? They're not even in control of themselves, but they're trying constantly by tapping into their third energy, just trying to control and micromanage. And it's a, it, it's a very daunting, exhaustive behavior. 
that isn't serving them, even though they think their mind thinks that it's serving them, but it really isn't serving them. And if they were to just balance you know, their energy centers, they would have so much more energy now because everything is flowing. They'd be so much more creative. They'd be more peaceful. So um, something to think about. Okay. So next, the subatomic level. So all of this starts at the subatomic level, the quantum level. So let's discuss how that happens. So you're going to take a look at figure 4.6. And if you take two atoms, just two, each with its own nucleus, and you put them together to form a molecule, the overlapping of the two circles where they bond is where they're sharing light and information. So, and because they're sharing information, they're sharing a similar energy that has a particular frequency. What's holding the two atoms together as a molecule is an invisible energy field. Once these atoms join to form a molecule and exchange information, they will have different physical properties and characteristics, such as different chemistry, a different boiling point, a different atomic, a different atomic weight, just to name a few. When they were sitting side by side, separated, they were different. It's important to note that what is giving the molecule its specific properties, as well as holding it into form and structure into matter is the invisible field of energy that is surrounding the matter. Molecules could not bond without sharing information and energy. So there's diagram 4.6 that shows from energy to matter, it goes from atom to molecule to chemical, to cell to tissue to heart to vascular system to the body. So as atoms, bond together and share energy and information, they form molecules. The molecule has an invisible field of light surrounding it, made up of the energy and information that give it the physical properties to hold it together. As more atoms join that molecule, it becomes more complex and forms a chemical, also with an invisible field of light surrounding it, that is the energy and information giving it physical properties to hold together. As more atoms join the chemical, it becomes more complex and it can form a cell. The cell is surrounded by its own specific invisible field of energy and information, giving it instruction to function. So as a group of cells join together in turn, they become a tissue with a field of energy and information that allows the cells to function in harmony. The tissues join together to become an organ with an energy field around it and information that allows the organ to function in a healthy manner. So the organs join together to become a system with a specific invisible field of light surrounding it, providing the physical properties for it to function as a whole. And finally, all of the systems in the body join together to form a body. The body's surrounding field of light holds energy and information, providing it with the physical properties to hold it together and give it instructions for life. So if you add another atom, you form yet another different molecule that again has different physical properties and characteristics and a different atomic structure. And if you keep adding more and more atoms, you form a chemical and there's an in invisible field of energy around that chemical that's holding it together in physical form, giving life to that chemical. And those atomic forces are real and they're measurable. You can kind of see how those are the building blocks of life and how our bodies are from the subatomic level all the way up to the entire body. So if you take enough chemicals and put them together, you're going to ultimately form a cell and the cell has an invisible field of energy surrounding it, giving life to the cell. The cell is actually feeding off different frequencies of life, if not molecules and positive or negative charges that are instructing the cell to do what it does. According to the new field of biology called quantum information biology, it's the biophotons we discussed earlier and their patterns of light and frequency that the cells emit that receives 
that give the instructions. The healthier the cell, the more coherent the biophotons it emits. If you remember from what you've learned so far, coherence is an orderly expression of frequency. The exchange of information via the electromagnetic frequencies of light between the cell and the field surrounding it happens faster than the speed of light, which means it happens on the quantum level. So to continue, if you put a group of cells together, you form a tissue. If that tissue has an invisible field of unifying coherent frequency and energy that causes all of those cells to work together in harmony, functioning as a community, if you take that tissue and further develop it into more specialized function, you form an organ. And an organ also has an invisible field of electromagnetic energy. That organ literally receives information from that invisible energy field. In fact, the memory of the organ actually exists in that field. So the way this can affect transplant patients is fascinating. Probably the most famous example is the story of Claire Sylvia. She wrote a book called A Change of Heart about her experiences after receiving a heart and lung transplant in 1988. All she knew at the time was that her new organs came from an 18-year-old male donor who died in a motorcycle accident. After the transplant, the 47-year-old professional dancer and choreographer developed cravings for chicken nuggets, french fries, beer, green peppers, and snicker bars, none of which were her foods that she had enjoyed before. Her personality also changed. She became more assertive, more confident. Her teenage daughter even teased her about developing a man's gait. When Sylvia eventually tracked down the family of her donor, she discovered the foods she had craved after the transplant were indeed the young man's favorites. The vital information was stored in the field, in the light field of the organ. The most dramatic story illustrating this involves an eight-year-old girl who after receiving a heart transplant from a 10-year-old girl began having vivid nightmares after being murdered. The donor had indeed been murdered and the perpetrator had not been caught. The patient's mother took her to a psychiatrist who was convinced that the girl was dreaming about events that had actually occurred. They contacted the police, who opened an investigation using the girl's detailed account of the murder, including information on the time and the place of the crime, the weapon, the physical characteristics of the criminal, the clothing of the murderer, what he was wearing, and the killer was identified, arrested, and convicted. So in these cases, that information in the energy field surrounding the transplanted organ changed the expression of the energy field of the individual once the person had a transplant. It's different light and different information mixing with the transplant patient's pre-existing field. The recipient can pick up on that information as memory in the field, and it influences their mind and their body. The energy holding specific information is influencing matter. Fascinating. Then when you group organs together, you form a system such as a musculoskeletal system, the cardiovascular system, digestive, reproductive, endocrine, lymphatic, nervous, and immune systems, to name a few. These systems function by drawing information from that invisible field of energy and consciousness that surrounds them. And when you put all the systems together, you form a body that also has an in invisible field of electromagnetic energy surrounding it. And that vital electromagnetic field of light is who we actually really are. So now back to the hormones of stress. As I mentioned earlier, when you're in survival mode and you're drawing too much from this invisible field of energy to turn it into chemistry in your physical body, whether you're oversexed, overeating, overstressed, or all at once, this energetic field around your body diminishes. That means that 
there's not enough energy or light surrounding the body to give proper instructions to matter for homeostasis, growth, and repair. When that occurs, these individual centers no longer receive, process, or express energy, and they no longer produce a healthy neurological mind to send the necessary signals to the associated parts of the body where the centers innervate. Since that energy, with a conscious intent moving through or activating neurological tissue creates mind, the energy centers diminish in the expression of the minds to regulate the cells, tissues, organs, and systems of the body because there's no energy moving through them. The body begins to function more like a piece of matter without the proper coherent energy of light and information. Those mini brains become incoherent just as our brain becomes incoherent. So in addition, when the brain is incoherent and compartmentalized, because of the hormones of stress, that incoherent brain then sends a very incoherent message like static on a radio down the central nervous system to each of the plexus of neurons that have to do with communicating with the body. And when these mini brains receive incoherent messages, then they send an incoherent message through the organs, tissues, and cells in each area in the body that's related to each one of these centers. This in turn affects the hormonal system and expression and nerve conductivity going to different organs and tissues and cells in the body. And this incoherence begins to create disease or imbalance. I'm going to interject here also syndromes, which, which is the malfunctioning of a, a normal immune system response. The result is that when these individual brains become incoherent, each corresponding area of the body becomes incoherent and they don't work well. We don't work well. Increasing energy. In the blessing of the energy centers meditation, when you learn how to rest your attention in each of these centers and become aware of space and time and the space around them, you create coherence in each of these little brains in the same manner as you create coherence in the big brain between your ears. As you acknowledge the particle matter by resting your attention in your perineum or the first center, or in the space behind your belly button for the second center, or in the pit of your gut, your third center, or in the center of your chest, your fourth center, and so on and so on. You're anchoring your attention in that center. And where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So then you'll move to placing your attention in or opening your focus to the space around each of those centers tuning in to the energy beyond that center. And as you do this, it's vitally important that you move into a state of an elevated emotion, such as love or gratitude or joy. As you know from the previous chapters, this is important because the elevated emotion is energy. And the longer you can hold that open focus from a state of elevated emotion, the more you will build a very coherent field with a very high frequency around that center in your body. So once you build that coherent field around a center, that center has a coherent energy with the right instructions to draw from. The atoms, the molecules, and chemicals that form the cells that create that tissue that make up those organs and systems of the body will be drawing from a new field of light and information and more coherent energy, carrying a more intentional message, giving new instructions to each center of the body. The body will then begin to respond to a new mind. As you surrender and move into the present moment and you understand that you, that where you place your attention is where you are placing your energy, you can build a new field of light and information and raise your frequency of the signal. And that intentional thought directs energy through each one of your centers to produce a new mind in that individual brain. 
As each center draws from a new field of frequency and information, your body moves back towards balance and homeostasis. Now, this is a new state. You become more energy and less matter, more wave and less particle. The more the elevated the emotion, the more the energy you create and the more dramatic a shift can result. I'm going to pause here right now. Uh, one of the things that I hear oftentimes you know, from people who I guide is, uh, you know, how if I'm trying to, I understand, you know, taking my focus from outside to inside, yada, yada. What I have trouble with is like, okay, I, I know my intention is I want to heal X, Y, Z, or I want to manifest, you know, X, Y, Z. But the elevated emotion part, I don't know how to create an elevated emotion. And that is the fuel. It's like the gasoline that you're lighting a match to that is going to fuel the rocket ship to, to be permanently set in 5D so that those waveforms turn into particle. Just having the focus, just having the intention isn't enough. The emotion is the rocket fuel that launches it into outer space so the order is officially placed and then it can manifest into 3D. And so, for example, someone who says, it's like, well, yeah, you know, I would love, you know, a job that pays me double, for example. I want a job that pays me double or, you know, my body has been, has felt bad for 20 years. Um, I've been in so much pain for so long that I don't even, how would I, how would I create an elevated emotion? I don't even know what my body is going to feel like once it feels good. I'm like, well, prior to 20 years ago, then just remember what it was like when you were a kid, when you didn't have any pain or imagine what it would, how awesome it would feel to not have that pain in your body, to instead feel great, to feel strong, to feel flexible, to feel energized, so energized that you want to go take a walk, you want to go take a run, you want to jump on a bike, you want to try all the things you haven't been able to do because your body physically has been unable to do it, you now feel, wow, I can do it. Um, the other way to explain this is to make believe. Every single one of us, I don't care what where on the globe you're from, we all as children, as a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, we played make-believe. We pretended to be, you know, cops and robbers. We pretended to be Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, um, Cat Woman, Elasta Woman, yada, yada, yada. We made believe that we were Snow White or we were Cinderella or we made believe that we were uh, Kim by the white lion and we were jumping from tree to tree to tree and you know running around and as a child when you were playing pretend and you were making believe you know as you pick up uh, I remember with my brother you know my brother and I we would play you know cat and mouse and we would play you know cops and robbers and I remember making from branches off of a tree taking a branch off the tree taking a clothes clothes clip and putting a rubber band and then just tying it together and making a rubber band gun from that stick. And so I was very consciously aware when my brother and I began to play in the backyard after him, he made his, I made mine. And then we started to run around and we were shooting each other with rubber bands. I forgot that that stick wasn't a real gun, just as he forgot. I forgot that I was actually Lillian and that he was my brother. I was now the cop and he was now the robber and I was in active pursuit and I was completely absorbed. I was in a trans state, if you will, where I was in that make-believe land and it was phenomenal. It was so much fun. I would get lost for hours playing with my brother until my mom would call us in to come in for dinner and that woke us up out of that state. And then now we're off to that. But during that, you know, probably within 30 seconds, I would say of our beginning to play cops and robbers, I lost sight of the fact that that rubber band gun wasn't real. But once I was engaged in that pretending, it may as well have been, you know, a real gun. And so that's all we're doing in meditation is you are 
creating a map of the future is what Dr. Joe talks about in the meditations. It's like whatever it is that you want. If you have diabetes and you would love to get rid of this diabetes that maybe you've had since you were 12 years old, let's say you were diagnosed when you were 12 years old and now you're 30 or 40 something and now you want to get rid of it. Well, you can create an elevated emotion of joy. You just forward cast. It's creating a memory in the future. Your brain doesn't know the difference because it doesn't know time, past, present, or future. So the fact that you're creating a memory in the future, you're making believe that at some point in the future, you are daydreaming, if you will, and you're making believe it's like, wow, I no longer have a sub Q. If you have a sub Q pump and you're a diabetic, I no longer have a sub Q pump. I am, I am in perfect health. My body feels great. I don't ever feel um, the ups and downs of my insulin being up or down. Doesn't matter what I eat now. I can eat everything. You see yourself in a good, healthy state. You see yourself working out. You can eat anything. You can eat pizza. You can have a, you can have a banana fudge. You know. Um, chocolate chip sundae, you are fine and you feel how exciting you see yourself maybe celebrating your birthday or some other celebration, 4th of July, where all those things that you have to make out of, have had to make adaptations for, you now just make believe that in that forward mapping that you have created for yourself, you create the elevated emotion of joy and your friends going, oh my gosh, it's so awesome to see you, you know, doing this, this and that again. And it's like, isn't it fun, you know, that we're able to go to 31 flavors and have um, a chocolate sundae and you don't have to worry about that and you don't have to prick your finger anymore, yada, yada, yada. And it's like, yeah, that's all behind me now. And you may even want to vision, vision yourself as, you know, being at the doctor's office where they're confirming, they're like, my God, what did you do? It's like, Everything is well within the normal ranges. There's absolutely no evidence of you ever having had diabetes and you just beaming with joy going, I knew it. This is exactly what I expected to happen. I knew I could do this. And the doctor just saying, yeah, there's no reason for you to get rid of that sub Q pump. It's, it's a waste because right now you're just throwing away money. It's just your body's just filtering it out because it doesn't need it anymore. And you're going, yes, 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 I knew I could do it. You imagine the conversation you will have with your doctor as they tell you, oh, we got our results in. And you rehearse what you would say. And what's uncanny about this, I can only speak from my, from my own personal experience. As I've had, I've had to not only heal my body from having been hit by a bus, which I'm not insinuating that I'm 100% because I'm not. I still have things that I'm working on. However, I've also used the meditations to manifest situations which presented themselves either in an emergency or a crisis that was clearly unwanted. And in that moment, I realized I need to do a walking meditation because this is completely unacceptable um, or this is dangerous or whatever the case might be. And in every circumstance that I did that, I, after I finished the meditation, I realized once it became obvious to me in 3D that I had manifested um, with an amazing amount of speed, I might add in some cases, uh, that it was not a deja vu experience, which is, before it happens to you, you would think it would be a deja vu experience. That's what I would expect. That's what my logical brain and reasoning brain tells me it should be like, but it's in my experience, it hasn't been at all deja vu. Instead, it's almost like you hit the rewind button of a video, and now you're rewatching the exact same thing that you saw in your mind's eye is now in front of you, and you find yourself saying the exact same things that you said in the motion picture screen of your mind, and you see that other person that is part of your co-creation who, as far as you know, they didn't meditate or do anything to create this, but they were one of the actors in the motion picture screen of your mind. They're saying exactly what you expected them to say as you created this in 5D. This is the most bizarre thing. And then it comes to pass and you're like, wow, 
it's like a replay, like a rewind, and it happened here and boom, now it's happening here so quickly thereafter. It's amazing. And you know that you know that you know, after you've done a few of these, you will know that you'll know that you know that this in fact was your own creating. It's not happenstance. And I'm gonna share, uh, I eventually have to get these videos up because a lot of the stuff, 2019, I had a flurry of these. Uh, not that it has stopped, it has continued. But 2019, I just kept, up. it was a magical year, but there were a lot of things that kept on happening. Even though I was being careful, you know, I heard the divine tell me, pay attention. So I paid attention, do this, I did that. And still unwanted things were happening. I'm like, what the heck? You know, it's like, I'm paying attention. I'm taking extra measures of precaution. And still I would have certain things happen. And one particular case where, I happened to be in, uh, I was in Rome and I drove down to the Amalfi Coast about three and a half hours down uh, like the equivalent of PCH here in, in the States, in California. And I went to take a ceramics class. I was in Minori for like three days. And long story short, after I got out of this ceramics class, I, I had parked, you know, went to the ceramics class that was at four o'clock. And then the uh, by the time I got back at the end of the ceramics class, had dinner, da da da, toilet, walked around the town. Then it was like nine o'clock at night. And I went to go get my car, and now the gates were actually closed to the place where I had, you know, come to park my car and take the class. But there was no sign. I read Italian, so there was no sign that said, you know, you know gates close at 6 p.m., nine, nothing. There is nothing to say, you know, only park between the hours of nine to five, nine to six, nothing. So I return now, it's nine o'clock, 9.13 to be exact. I get to my car and the gate has this very unusual looking padlock. And as I'm looking at this, I'm going, what the heck, it's 9.13 at night. I, uh, there's nothing here that says that I shouldn't park here after a certain hour or that they were going to lock the gate. So now here I am in Minori. My hotel is 17 kilometers down the Amalfi coast. It's nighttime. Everything is pretty quiet, pretty much dead. There's really nobody walking around at this hour. And I am finding myself in this predicament in this jam where this thing is locked and there's no one that I can ask. There's no phone number to anything. So I'm like, Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So I'm like, seriously. And I immediately within, as soon as I realized that the lock was on there, I'm like, Oh my gosh, seriously. I didn't even get upset. I was just like talking to the divine and talking to God going, are you seriously going to be doing this to me? And it's like, I know I can get the car with, out with meditation, but do we really have to do this again? Oh, I'm like, you know, okay, if I'm supposed, I know that I can get this, the car out with meditation. I'm like, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I know I can, I know that this is definitely slowing me down, but I'm like, okay, if I need to do this and if, if in fact, the only reason why this is happening is for me to document my car locked here and then me document once I get it out that this meditation works so that one person has enough evidence where they believe that these meditations work for everything, not just for healing, not just for making you feel peaceful and centered and opening your energy centers, yada, 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 but that it works for all sorts of things when it comes to manifesting then so be it. So let me see if I can find a picture. And I don't even know if this picture will show up. I'll see if I can find this really quick so I can show you here. Yeah, here we go. So I think, I don't know if you'll be able to see here in the camera, I'm trying to show you. That is the gate 
And you see how there's a padlock on there? So that's where my, here's a close up of the padlock. And so I'll play this video. I'm going to do another, I'm going to actually edit this and I'm in Pietro, have had a perfect day so far, and I'm finding myself having an unwanted adventure. Perfect day so far, and I'm finding myself having an unwanted adventure. I came to this Fornace Ceramica di Arte, which you see right there. The GPS, of course, took me here because this is the address that I was given. And so I went ahead and I parked in there because I'm where I'm supposed to be for the ceramics class. And that class was at four. It's now nine o'clock. And I, the class was actually not in this location. I ended up meeting right in front over here where the plaza is, where the statue of the mermaid is, the city plaza. I ended up meeting Victoria there. And then she gave me the tour of Vietro. And then we went to the ceramics class where they teach you how to paint the ceramic and so forth. So now this thing is locked. So now I know better than to freak out or get nervous or worried because obviously that's not going to fix the problem. Doesn't do any good whatsoever. So what do I need to do? I just need to get in theta state. Do my deep breathing, get myself into theta state, focus on what I want, which is that gate to be open, visualize myself in my car again, driving to my hotel, which is about 30 minutes away from here, 17 kilometers, just literally, literally down that road, down the coast. I'm on the Amalfi Coast here. And, uh, and that's it. So... I will do a follow-up video <laughs> and I don't really, I would rather just go get in my car and go, but apparently I'm supposed to do this again to get rid of an unwanted thing and show you guys, I guess, that this works. So here I am. Okay. <laughs> Can you believe this? Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, I had, sorry, I had a little bit of an attitude, but okay. So I did like a three minute meditation. I didn't even spend that much time oming out. I just did three minutes. When I felt that it was done, I let it go. I surrendered. You know, I have no idea how long it's going to take. So I kind of looked around. That was 9 13 p.m. I don't know if the details will show up, if I could show. I don't know if this will be. It was nine, yeah, nine sixteen p.m. If you can see, and it converts it. When I was over there, it was in uh, Italian time, and then it brought it to American time. So it's showing twelve. Can you see there? It says twelve. It might be too blurry, but it's basically a um, nine sixteen. So the next video. So what happened next was, let it go. I thought, okay, well, I know I'm not supposed to do anything to make anything happen because. The order's in, it's done. My, I don't have to do anything else. Now I let go. I know that it's going to happen. I just don't know how long it's gonna take. So I'm like, okay. So I thought to myself, I'm like, okay, well, I don't know what to do next. Um, there's nothing I need to actively do to make it happen because I already did the most important part. So I said, you know, I may have to spend the night out here. Geez, it's pretty cold because it was pretty cold. Uh, as you can imagine, this was in December just a few months ago. And long story short, I thought, okay, well, I just kind of looked around. And the next thing I know, this black car with two young men pulls up. It's like a black Honda with black smoked mirrors. It pulled up. And this is what happened next. Okay, thank goodness he opened it for me. So this was at 927, not even 15 minutes later, these two guys never looked at me, 
never made eye contact. We never spoke to each other. From being inside the car, the driver just got out, unlocked it, and then I was off to the races. And then here. So now. No one is more relieved than me to get out of here. That guy opened the gate for me. I didn't even meditate for, I don't know, five minutes maybe. Wow, it is amazing how the meditations work. <laughs> it is crazy. Okay, so that, that's completely obviously unedited video. They're just raw there. So. It's crazy. This stuff works for everything. So that is another reason why I'm so passionate about this work in getting people to start to implement the meditations and to, to practice becoming supernatural. The impossible is possible. There's no question about it. And it's funny because for years I've had this tagline, um, dream the impossible dream. It's possible. And that has come to life in a way that I could not have imagined through the work that I've learned with Dr. Joe. So let's move on to the next, next, <clears throat> we're almost done with this chapter. We are now on page 134. Once you build that field, that coherent field around a center, the center has a coherent energy with the right instructions to draw from the atoms, molecules, and chemicals that form the cells that create the tissues that make up the organs and systems of the body will be drawing from a new field of light and information and a more coherent energy, a more intentional message giving new instructions to each center of the body. The body will then begin to respond to a new mind as you surrender and move into the present moment and you understand that where you place your attention is where you are placing your energy. You can build a new field of light and information and raise the frequency of the signal. And that intentional thought directs energy through each center to produce a new mind in that individual brain. As each center draws from a new field of frequency and information, the body moves back towards balance and homeostasis. And in this new state, you become more energy and less matter, more wave and less particle. The more elevated the emotion, the more energy you create and the more dramatic a shift can result. Okay, I'm gonna reread this because this is one of the most important parts about your state in meditation. <clears throat> Intentional thought directs energy through each center to produce a new mind in that individual brain as each center draws from a new field of frequency and information, the body moves back towards balance or homeostasis. And in this new state, here is key, you, your physical and energetic body, you become more energy and less matter more wave and less particle. The more elevated emotion, AKA joy, gratitude, ecstatic, blissed, euphoric, thrilled. Those are the emotions that I tap into every single time I'm manifesting and creating something in 5D. I put the intention of the vision of what it is that I want. I add the ed elevated emotion of joy, of ecstatic happiness, thrilled, exuberant, joyous, blissed out, thrilled to pieces. And then I seal the gift with gratitude. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you, thank you, God. Thank you, divine. Thank you, my angels. Thank you, my guides. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then when I come back from the meditation, three minutes, 30 minutes, three hours, it doesn't matter. I come back, I let it go. I surrender, I let it go. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, I downloaded 
if you will, or uploaded as it were. It's really an upload, not a download. I've uploaded the information. I've put my order in. I have no idea how long it's going to take. None, zero, whatsoever. But it doesn't matter whether it takes 15 minutes, whether it takes 15 hours, 15 months, doesn't matter. I let it go. And now I'm like, I know that I have in the queue all these little manifestations that I put the order in. So it's going to happen. So my joy now is that at any moment, at any second, I will have something unexpected happen. And it could be the specific manifestation that I wanted or something that puts me in the path that's going to guarantee that I get my manifestation. So I wake up, walk, do everything in this state of joy every day because I have all sorts of unexpected, awesome surprises coming my way. Even the surprises that sometimes don't appear to be on the face, maybe others would not think it's pleasant. I still know that it's for my benefit because it's if it's a door closing, it's because that's the wrong door for me to go open. That's the door that I need to be looking at, not this door. And so on and so forth. So I just have this eager anticipation knowing that I have all these little surprises coming and I've had things manifest within seven days. I've had that one in particular took 15 minutes. I had my cell phone. I also have the video. I won't, I won't play it this time. I'll play it on another one where my phone was, my cell phone was stolen in Sardinia, Italy. Can you believe it? Stolen. So I'm like, oh my gosh, when you have your phone stolen, I don't care if it's stolen. You set it down on a counter at LAX International Airport or if it's stolen because you are in some public place and somebody picked it up and took it. Nobody gets a stolen item back ever. Well, I did the exact same thing. I said, okay. The moment I realized that my phone was stolen, I slowed down my heart rate. I said, oh, got to slow down my heart rate, slow down my breath. I need to get into theta state, slow down my brain waves, get into theta state. And I just need to apply the formula. One hour later, without me doing anything, I was also affirming, which is something I still do. I kept on affirming that men are magical, mystical creatures. So as luck would have it, I had not one, not two, not three, not four. I had six to eight. I don't, I don't remember counting, but I know that there was at least six to eight men all of a sudden helping me look for my cell phone in this plaza in Sardinia. And one of them in particular then went with me and an hour later, he placed it in my hand, just as I had envisioned in my meditation. And I did a walking meditation for an hour. The entire hour that I was with him, I did that walking meditation. Just did that. And I didn't have to do anything other than be with him and do the walking meditation. And he's the one who actually did the searching. And then boom, he ended up putting it in my hand. It was incredible. Meditations work. So this works for everything. And that's what I want people to know. This type of turning the waveforms of energy into particle really works. It's not just in the times of Jesus, the times of Lao Tzu and Buddha and uh, Rumi and all the mystics of old. This is happening today, right now. And there are thousands and thousands, not just thousands, tens of thousands, maybe more, maybe hundreds of thousands of people throughout the planet who are using this information and applying it for their benefit. And you can too. This is our birthright. We were born and equipped with all of this. So it's a matter to bring back in our member of a body, to remember and re-embody and to know again, to recognize this which is in us. So let's move on. 
to create more dramatic shifts that can result. Okay, so if on the other hand, you stay stuck in survival, emotions of worry, fear, anxiety, frustration, anger, distrust, and so on, you don't have this energy, this information, and this light around your body. And as the frequency, light and energy slow down and become more incoherent in each center, you become more matter and less energy until your body begins to become diseased. That's the point of doing this meditation, to speed up the frequency so it entrains the lower disorganized frequency back into coherence and orderliness. Raising the frequency of matter or entraining matter to a new, more coherent mind. Now, I'm going to take a second here. I'm going to do a share screen because I want to show you a YouTube video that shows, I believe there's either 64 or 72 metronomes, all that are started at different times. And in just a couple minutes, just two, three minutes, you go from having, you know, instead of doing this live, what I'll do is I, I will put the link so that you can watch it then on your own time. Or you can just Google YouTube. Uh, metronome entrainment and you'll see there's quite a few of them there's one that has i think like 64 or 72 metronomes and in less than three four minutes they all from being all in chaos going at different rates at different speeds in less than three or four minutes they're all perfectly synced with each other and through doing these meditations this is exactly what we we're doing for the globe at large all of us who are actively engaging in this act of meditation broadcasting love we are getting the rest of humanity and the rest of beings, plants, animals, you name it, is in training to us because we are coherent, then they by default become coherent as well. Okay. So a more coherent mind and more a more coherent heart. That's what we want. So, but remember, you can't muscle this. You can't just will it or force it to happen. You can't be attached. You have to surrender. You have to let go. It's part of your superpower now as you're surrendering. You're letting go. You can't do it by trying. You can't do it by hoping. And you can't do it by wishing. I love what Dr. Joe says. He says, hoping. Hope is a beggar. You're hoping. Just listening to the word, I hope. You can feel the shortage, the lack, the, the fear of it not happening. I hope. Hope is a beggar. You can't do it by wishing. Melissa Piers uh, says, wishing is wishy-washy. No, you don't want to wish. You don't want to hope. You want to know. You want to put the order in and let go. Put the order in, elevated emotion, gratitude, let go. Because you can't do it with your conscious mind. You have to get into your subconscious mind because that's where the operating system, your OS, just like in your computer, the autonomic nervous system that functions and controls all of these centers. You have to get out of your beta brain, which is the brain that you're using right now to listen and to read this book. Get out of your beta brain wave pattern because beta keeps you in your conscious mind separated from your subconscious mind or your autonomic nervous system that actually runs the show. The deeper you go into meditation, from beta wave, wave range to alpha brain waves, and then to theta brain waves, that's that half awake, half sleep state of deeper meditation where your body is actually asleep, but your mind is clear and awake, that's theta. The slower your frequency, and the more access you have to the operating system. I'm going to stop right here. There's a couple things I want to mention because um, I never think about alpha brain waves. My thing is when I meditate, whether I'm meditating because I'm facing something unwanted or I'm meditating because I'm broadcasting love or meditating because I want to heal something in me, my first thing is I'm going to go into theta state. I've got to slow down my heart rate. I gotta slow down my breath, and then I'm going to slow down my brain waves. And once I do that, I command my brain. I learned with there's a French uh, French therapist named um, Colette Stryker, and Colette Stryker, um, she is the founder of the Map Institute. She's amazing. She one of the things that I learned with her 
was that you can command your super consciousness to order your subconsciousness to do X, Y, Z. So I just simply order my super consciousness. I say, brain, do as I say. This is what we're doing now. We're focusing on going into theta state. In three breaths, I'm going to go into theta. I don't need to do, I used to do 10 breaths, and then I decided to shorten it to three. Why the heck not? The reality is I could do it now in one. I like the feeling of the prep with three, so I do always a minimum of three. But I have found that I can just begin to start breathing, and sometimes I immediately go into theta in the first breath. I still give myself three breaths and then move forward because my body is benefiting from that alkalizing of my doing the breaths. And then I do the breath that Dr. Joe teaches us, which is, is you know, that's part of one of the key components of being uh, doing this meditation so that it works for you. So I have a video on how to get into theta state and how to know that you're actually in theta state. If you want to check that out, just go to damelillianwalker.com and you'll see the video on how to get into theta state. That would have saved me so much time. If I would have had a video like that years ago when I started uh, meditating, I wish I would have had it. So once I learned and I was able to confirm that I was in theta state, then I, over time I finally, because I had people reaching out to me, I finally decided, you know what, I'm just going to do a video on this. And um, so I hope it helps you. So the half awake, half asleep state of deeper meditation is the theta brain state. It's where you don't feel your body anymore because you're just in the void. So the slower your frequency and the more the access you have to the operating system. So in the blessing of the energy centers meditation, your job is going to be to slow your brain waves down and combine an elevated emotion with an intent to bless each one of your energy centers and for the greatest good, loving them into life and then surrender and allow your autonomic nervous system to take over because it already knows how to do that without any help from your conscious mind. So you're not thinking, you're not visualizing, and you're not analyzing. You're doing something that may at first seem much more difficult, and it's not. You're planting a seed of information and letting go, allowing it to take the instructions and energy and use them to create more balance and order in your body. So we actually have measured how effectively our students can use this meditation to both increase energy in each of their energy centers and achieve balance among the centers. And to do this, we use the gas discharge vi visualization device that you read about in the previous chapter to take measurements of participants' energy fields both before and after they do the blessing of the energy centers meditation. So the GDV technology uses a specialized camera to take images of a subject's finger while weak and totally, totally painless. Electrical current is applied to the fingertip for less than a millisecond, and the body responds to the current by discharging an electron cloud made up of photons. While the discharge is not visible to the naked eye, the GDV device's camera can capture it and translate it into a digital computer file. Then a software program called BioWell uses the data to create an image like the one you see in Graphic 4 in the color insert. So Graphics 4A and 4D show how balanced or imbalanced the subject's energy centers are, both before and after meditation. The BioWell software uses the GDV data to estimate the frequency of each energy center and compare it to the norm. Balanced energy centers would appear in perfect alignment, while imbalanced centers would make an off-center pattern. The size of the circle representing each energy center shows whether its energy is less than or equal to or greater than average, and by how much. The left side of each example in graph four shows the measurements of the subject's energy centers taken before we started our workshop, while the right side shows the measures, the measurements taken a few days later. So now you're going to look at graphics 5A to 5D. The left side of the figure shows the measurement of the energy centers and the energy field around each student's entire body before we started the event. 
while the right side shows the measurement of the field around the whole body afterwards. So we've also used the GDV device to measure how this meditation, as well as any other meditations in this book, enhances the energy field surrounding the entire body. So as soon as you read the read in the instructions at the beginning of the meditation, I repeatedly ask you to place your attention not only on various parts of your body, but also on the space around those parts of your body. And then at the end of the meditation, on the space around your entire body, as you have learned where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So if you're putting your focus on this space, that is naturally where your energy is going to go. In doing this, you're using your attention, awareness and energy to build and enhance the field of light and information surrounding your body. This in turn creates order and centropy, coherence, instead of disorder and entropy, entropy, chaos, disorderliness. So now you are more coherent energy and less matter and you have your own enhanced field of light and information that you can draw from and to create all right blessing of the energy centers meditation so this meditation has become one of the most popular meditations among our students and has created an impressive number of supernatural results as i did in the previous chapter I will give you some basic instructions so that if you choose to do the meditation on your own, you'll know how to proceed. Begin by placing your attention on the first energy center, the base of your perineum, and then move to opening up your attention to the space around that center. And once you can sense the space around the center, bless that center for the greatest good and then connect to the elevated emotions like love, gratitude, or joy to raise the frequency of the center and also create a coherent field of energy. I'm going to stop right here because another question that I have a lot of people asking quite a bit is, how do you bless an energy center? What does it even mean to bless? It's very simple. Again, when you're having your focus and your attention on any energy center, and you're looking to bless each and every one of your energy center, you just say in your mind's eye, in your thoughts, with your mind, you consciously think, I bless my first energy center. That's it. Your intention to bless it, the divine, your autonomic nervous system knows far greater than your intellectual mind. You need to trust that it's doing exactly what you're asking it to do. Even when you're not even sure, you decide that you are sure. You can't get this wrong. There's no such thing as a bad meditation. You are applying, reapplying, and doing this. So you just give the instruction. I am blessing my first energy center. That's it, plain and simple, easy peasy. Okay. So you're going to do this for each of the seven energy centers of the body. And when you come to the eight, energy center, a place which is about 16 to 18 inches above your head, bless the center with gratitude and appreciation or thankfulness, because gratitude is the ultimate state of receivership. I like to say this all the time and quote Dr. Joe, gratitude is the ultimate state of receivership. The center will then begin to open the door to profound information from the quantum field. Now open your focus and place your attention on the electromagnetic energy surrounding your entire body, building a new field of energy. As your body draws from a new field of electromagnetic energy, you become more light and less matter and you raise your body's frequency. Now remember, if you're going to create the unlimited, you have to feel un limited. Got to repeat that because another highlight, another critical point. Remember, if you are going to create unlimited, you have to feel unlimited. 
if you're going to heal in a magnificent way, you have to feel magnificent. You have to pretend. You can start your meditation as you bring your focus and your attention to the different parts as he guides you. You can start saying, okay, I'm going to pretend that I am the most genius mystic healer, that I am going into the most profound level of theta, the deepest state of trans that I've ever been. I am going to do the most perfect meditation. Everything is going to be perfect. I am going to manage everything absolutely fine. I'm going to put a crystal clear picture. I'm going to have this, I'm just going to pretend to have the most exquisite state of joy and bliss and thankfulness and gratitude and appreciation. And then when you're done, you let it all go. That's it. Your brain doesn't know that you were making believe. It thinks that it really happened because as far as the brain is concerned, it did happen. So you're going to experience it in your mind's eye. And then you're going to experience it again in 3D. So tap into elevated emotion and sustain it through the meditation. Once you've blessed each of the energy centers, lie down for at least 15 minutes. Relax, surrender, and let your autonomic nervous system take orders and integrate all of this information in your body. Now, after you do any of these meditations, I know that I get a lot of questions from people also about different feelings. Is this normal? My body was shaking uncontrollably. Um, I felt um, a zapping. I felt sometimes it's a piezoelectric effect that they're feeling. And um, oftentimes people are not sure of what the piezoelectric effect would feel like. Sometimes, you know, when you rub your feet on carpet and all of a sudden you feel a snapping sensation, it, it, might happen on your feet or you might, after doing that, you might touch something metal and it'll shock your hand. It doesn't really hurt, but it startles you. That is a very similar, very similar feeling. Um, when I do it in meditation, it tends to go up my left or my, my right. I've even had it go up both sides. Like I had one meditation, I remember being very surprised where it went up my left side it was boom. And then on my right side, it was really loud. It went up right afterwards, boom. And it was much louder. And I thought, whoa, that's a trip. It went up my left. And then it went up my right. And my left was softer than my right. And I thought, that's got to mean something. But I just kept on meditating. So there's no right. There's no wrong. You might have all of a sudden a yawning attack where you start yawning, 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 yawning. You might start hiccuping. You might feel a little lightheaded or woozy. Um, you might see stars. Uh, who knows? But it's all energy moving inside of your body, and it's all perfect. It's exactly, you know, you're getting a biological upgrade because you've made certain adjustments. You put the order in. So now that energy is going to, sometimes you actually feel like a swirling energy inside your guts, which is kind of an unusual, it's like kind of like a snaky kind of a, very unusual um kind of a cool feeling and that's all it is it's energy moving and it's rearranging and reorganizing and resetting things and it's perfect it's as it should be so that concludes chapter four i am so glad that you tuned in tapped in turned on um tammy richards would you like to um do you have any questions any comments would you like to say anything i enjoy that you're reading these books um, and I too okay. have a problem with I don't hear anything. So I'm going to assume that you don't have any questions. I don't think I see any. Oh, I got somebody sent a chat. Oh, from Louise. Hi, Louise. Okay, so fantastic. We just had a hi from Louise. And okay, so I think that is. All for now, we will be doing chapter five, which is, uh, I'm going to be doing that at 9 p.m. tonight. I'm trying to catch up because last night I've been having a lot of downloads here. And so last night I didn't do chapter four. And tonight I'm on schedule now to do chapter five at 9 p.m. So thank you for tuning in. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you know how to reach me, Facebook, through Instagram, just private message me. 
I'm here to help. This is my way of paying it forward. And uh, thanks for joining us today. And you can't hear me. For chapter five at 9 p.m. tonight. All right, ciao for now. 